Ashley Zavakai, and this is Just Between Us. On tonight's show, I have with me co-host of PA Magazine, Tim Klein. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Leslie. Oh, it's very nice to have you. So first of all, tell us about yourself. If I wear a size 9 <laughs> 33 uh, inch length of my arms really? and 15 and a half collar. Well, that's very good. Like you said, co-host of PM Magazine mm -hmm. on Channel 3, which is a fun job. I came to Hartford about a year ago mm -hmm. from California where I anchored news wow. for a year and a half. And before that, I was in Chicago doing TV commercials. And before that, PM Magazine in Des Moines, Iowa. I got into television, Leslie, in 1980 mm -hmm. when I was 26 or 7 at the time. Mm -hmm. And before that, just sort of bummed around after college, trying to determine what it is I wanted to do in my life. And that is it in a nutshell. Really? Now we have roughly 58 minutes to kill. Well, how about telling us who influenced you the most? That would have to be my grandfather. Why? My grandfather is still alive, and he lives in Newark, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And he was a vaudeville comedian really? way back in the 30s and 40s. He was a stand-up comedian in local lounges and vaudevillian theaters in and around Cleveland, Ohio. And every time we see him, he would tell jokes, and they're usually off color. <laughs> and when my wife gets all embarrassed, and she gets all totally red, and I know when he has her in the corner, and she turns red, he's telling her jokes. <laughs> but he, I guess, would be my biggest influence and man I look up to with great esteem, because he's a funny guy. Show business is in his blood. Mm -hmm. And to this day, at age 87, he still tells jokes, and he plays the drums, and he keeps on plugging away, and he's a great guy, too, a very nice guy. Now, being that he did comedy, why did you decide, I, you're not a comedian? <laughs> I mean, right. well, you tried it. No, I'm just kidding. My wife will tell you that. <laughs> no, but what made you get into anchoring and now co-hosting PM Magazine? Back in 1980, which is uh, how many years ago? Seven years ago. Mm -hmm. I was sort of floundering. I had done a lot of traveling in Europe, like I said a moment ago, trying to determine what it is I wanted to do in life with my career. I started watching television daily because I didn't have very much to do. Mm -hmm. And I saw some television shows I thought that I could do, that I could host. I thought, why not go for it? Why not try to get a job in TV? At the time, I was living in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was thinking, why don't I get a job in TV? And I could be a host, I could make lots of money, become a millionaire, retire. <laughs> it sounds simple, doesn't it? Pretty well, much. Well, it wasn't that easy because I went out to every single small TV station in Minnesota, in about a week's worth of time. I went basically door to door trying to get a job in TV. And I was much older at the time than you kids are now putting on this program. You're in high school. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, after a week, I didn't get a job. And I had a resume that said, I could do this, I can do that. People didn't believe me. And the, plus the fact that they said, I don't have any experience, so why am I even looking? So I came back to my parents' home in Minneapolis. And they said, so what's your next step? What are you going to do? And I said, I think I'll go to Europe. And I went back to Europe. I traveled. I went to Italy and I went to Scotland and Northern Ireland because I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn about the world and, and to have a good time as well. It turns out that my money was running low, so I came back again. And I said, this is ridiculous. I have to get a job. I want to make a TV because I think I can do something and accomplish something with that type of a career. So I banged on the doors of a big local TV station in Minneapolis, KSTP Channel 5 which was the number one station at the time. And they said, go away. <laughs> you have no experience. Furthermore, we have no openings. Mm -hmm. A couple of days later, I found an ad in the paper. It was close to Christmas time. And it said, a local TV show, Twin Cities Today, which was on Channel 5, needed an associate producer, which is a person that assists the producer yeah. who arranges the entire program. So I went back to the station, and I said, hey, look, you said there were no jobs. Now there is one. Can I apply for this job? And they said, no, you can't. And I said, but look, I have, I can write. You know, I can tell jokes sometimes. I can arrange a program. I can be a production assistant. I'll do anything for you, and I'll do it for free. And they said, I'm sorry, but we want somebody with experience, at least two, three, four years experience. So they sent me away again. And I said, this is ridiculous. I've got to get this job. So I came back the next day, pounding on the door. The security guy at the place was getting sick of seeing me every day and seeing me being turned away. Yeah. And they said, no, I'm sorry. We don't have anything. Go away. I did this five days in a row, and it was Friday. The host of the program, because he found out I was, I was there every single day, came out. He was also the executive producer of the program. A guy by the name of Steve Edelman said, listen, where's this guy, Tim, this Tim Klein guy? And they said, he's waiting in the lobby. He's, he's been here for an hour. Please send him away and, and just have him leave and not come back, Steve. Tell him just to go away. He has no experience. So Steve came out and said, Tim, listen, these people are right. We need a person that has at least three, four years experience for this job because 
because of the demand of the job. He has to know what he's doing. But since you've been very persistent and consistent with coming back every single day, I'll tell you that there's an opening with a syndicated program. It's an agricultural show called Country Day, which airs five days a week. And it's taped live at 6.30 in the morning. And they're looking for a production assistant. And so why don't I put your name in for that job? And I was ecstatic. I said, hey, that is wonderful. I could show up to work right now. And they said, well, let me introduce you to this guy, Riney Nyan, I think it was his name. And he said, let me see what he says. So I, I met with Riney. And Riney liked me. He said, you've got a good college education. You obviously know what you're talking about. You can write. If you want the job, it's yours. You can start tomorrow morning. And I really think that they had other people at the station who wanted that job. Yeah. But in this case, persistence paid off. But it turns out that I came to work the next day, and what the job essentially was, was a glorified secretary. So I'd be at my desk, and they'd, all these people would be running around doing the show, producing it, and the talent would be doing their ins and outs or their introductions mm -hmm. and outros to stories. I'd just be at my desk typing letters to fans yeah. and that kind of stuff. But it was fun, and I made the most of it by working very hard during the day doing that. And at night, I would come back after a dinner break, and I'd go upstairs to the editing suites. And I'd take a couple of cassettes, and I'd pop them in the deck, and I'd teach myself how to edit. I learned how to work the, the audio board. The audio board allows you to talk into a microphone and feed it on the video yeah. tape. So learning how to do that, I practiced my voice. I would read scripts and try to make my voice a lot better and more pronounced and, and a lot stronger. And believe me, back in 1980, my voice was about 10 octaves higher. <laughs> Really, I sounded like Mickey Mouse, and I had to bring that down, and it took years to do that. I was accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. At that time, I decided that after six months, I was going to move from Country Day to an on-air position someplace, someplace else, maybe a different city, maybe a different state. And as it turns out, at that time, PM Magazine, which originated in San Francisco, was going into syndication, which meant that at one TV station, KPIX in San Francisco, the owner of PM Magazine was going to franchise it around the country, much like cable television or the syndicated programs you see on TV today. They were going to package something and then sell it to TV stations around the country. But what was new about PM Magazine was that you not only sold a package for a TV show, but you sold the idea of having local people in a given city host it throughout and have these people tie in these stories that were sent in from all around the country. And so PM Magazine caught on like wildfire. I think 90 to 120 stations around the, the country signed up for it. So 1981 was a big year, and I decided that at KSDP I was going to apply for this hosting job and get it. You know what my chances were? Virtually nil, because all these people that were applying had plenty of TV experience yeah. in, in the local markets, and here was some guy with no on-air ability applying for the job. Well, it turns out that I applied for maybe five PM jobs, and I got called back on three of them. One was in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. One was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And the other one was in Des Moines, Iowa. So I figured, well, these people want interviews. Since I'm closest to Des Moines, Iowa, what I think I'll do is give them a call. And if they say I can come down, I'll hop in my car and drive down. It was only about a four hour drive. So they said, sure, we'd love to have you come down. In fact, we're having an audition for 25 men and 25 women this Wednesday. Can you make it? And I said, I'll be there. I'll be there. Turns out I went down there and they said, a week ago we had a cattle call. And they advertised in the local newspapers that PM Magazine and WHO Television, Channel 13 in Des Moines, which incidentally Ronald Reagan worked at really? years ago as an announcer. They said that they were advertising for a PM co-host. They wanted a male and a female. And they wanted to hire these people from the Midwest, and that anybody who had TV ability should apply. So a week before I got down there, they had 385 men <laughs> More. lined up out their door, and I think 158 women applying for this job. And you know what they had to do? These people got one minute apiece on camera. They were marched in. They wore whatever they wanted to wear. Some people arrived in clown outfits, in tuxedos, others in casual wear, others in bathing suits. Whatever their strong point yeah. was, they tried to make themselves look like mm -hmm. that. Anyway, they had one minute in front of a camera to do whatever they wanted to. They could tell jokes. They could tell a story. 
They can talk about themselves, recite lines if they're an actor or actress. Can you imagine doing that? Having all these people, probably 50 people in the studio, plus the cameraman, and then knowing you're on videotape, you have one minute to st with that camera staring at you in the face to do whatever you wanted to do. Thank goodness you're a weak link. that I avoided that yeah. and I didn't have to do that. I, I just got in on the last 20. But what I did have to do was write some copy, an introduction to a story, which they wanted three paragraphs to four paragraphs. I had to memorize that and then stand up and do the introduction out in front of the station. Mm -hmm. And then I had to write a follow-up to that story. They put me in a room, they gave me a typewriter, and they said, go at it. And I'm thinking, okay, I have to invent a story here. I have to create some, yeah. I have to imagine some sort of a scenario. So I'm typing away like this. He said, I'll give you five minutes to do this. So I'm biting my nails, I'm starting to sweat. People are walking by and I'm seeing them out the door and I'm typing like crazy and I'm trying to create something here. And I didn't like it and I tear up my script yeah. and I type in something else. You know, the knock on the door. Oh boy. Uh, Mr. Klein, are you ready? And I said, yes, I guess I'm ready. <coughs> yes, I'm ready. <laughs> yes, I guess I'm, I guess I'm ready. Where would you like me? Come out here. So they put me out in front, they put a mic on me and I start to shake like this. I was petrified. Really, I was just petrified. And the first time I saw somebody go, okay, uh, Tim, uh, five seconds. <laughs> my heart fell down to my toes. Yep. And I, I'm starting to hyperventilate and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> I should be up in Minneapolis getting a job as a salesman or something where I wouldn't have to worry about this. And here's this guy going, go. <laughs> and I'm standing there and I think, okay, let me do this. And I, and I do it once. I sort of flustered my way through it. It was terrible. It was choppy and it was god awful. And then they had me do it again. And then I thought, hey, videotape is fantastic. You can do it as many times as you want. Yeah. And so I did it three, four times, and finally we got a good take. And I did the outro, and then I was done. And I felt like I had the world off my shoulders. I mean, I just felt great. I thought, mm -hmm. this is terrific. Now I'm done. I no longer have to worry about it. I'm all set. I won't get the job. Hey, at least it was a great experience. Yeah. And they said, eh, it wasn't too bad. A little <laughs> rocky, a little shaky there, but um, you know, you'll do. Tim, goodbye. We'll call you. And so I went back up to Minneapolis, and my friends gave me a call, and they said, how'd it go? How'd you do? I said I was terrible. It was horrifying. It was ridiculous, and I embarrassed myself. It was humiliating, and so forth. And they said, well, did you get the job? And I said, they won't let me know for about a week. I called every single day. And they said, eh, we're getting close. We're getting close. Then they called me back, and they said, Tim? And I said, yeah, I, I know what you're going to say. Come on down for a second interview. And this is after a week. I came back down for a second interview, and we were... Uh, there were six men and six women. And what they did was match us up to see who made the best combination or the best team. Mm -hmm. To make a very long story even longer, <laughs> they decided to choose me and another woman from Cedar Rapids who had her own morning talk show mm -hmm. named Sue Toma. And so the two of us started Pia Magazine in Iowa on September 1st. And I've got to tell you that my co-host Sue Toma was pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. I would work hard at work, and then I'd come home, and I'd work on voiceovers, and I'd work practice writing stories, and I'd do this, and I'd do that, and I'd collapse, and I'd get up in the morning, and I'd go back into work, and I'd start all over again. And I'd work seven days a week. We were pumping out stories and, and producing things, and, and we, we were working hard. I must tell you that at that time, as a, as a local celebrity, that, that teachers made more than I did. If you're thinking of getting into television, Forget it. unless you're Johnny Carson or Oprah Winfrey, you may want to think twice because money is, it's not there until you start getting up into the bigger markets. And that uh, took me a while to realize that. But it was fun. It was a great show. It ended after four years. Our show was, was canceled because <laughs> Wheel of Wasn't Fortune, of Wheel of Fortune blew us out of the water. And it was at that time that I moved to Chicago and I did some TV commercials there. What kind of commercials did you do? Auto commercials. Oh, really? You know, automobiles and... Uh, <laughs> this type of stuff. And I also did corporate videos and corporate films mm -hmm. where a company would say, Tim, would you produce this thing on a new product? Would yeah. you write it and hire a crew to shoot it? But I got out of that and I got into anchoring news in California when a, when a job came open. Now, out, so, out of all the three, which do you like better? Uh, doing PM Magazine, doing commercials or industrial films right. or doing news? Right. Could I take a sip of uh, you sure can. water, please? Right. Uh, no problem. Okay. I would have to say I enjoy doing them all. But doing commercials it would be the easiest. That's really? the easiest and not necessarily the most rewarding, but the most lucrative. In all honesty, I think doing PM Magazine would have to be the most fun 
because number one, we meet so many different people every single day. Yeah. And number two, it allows me to be entertaining. And I don't have to worry about my credibility like I did doing news. Because doing news, you have to be a certain persona. You have to mm. be hard. You can't show emotion and that sort of thing. And that's just not me. Yeah. What you see on the air basically is me, and that's why I like it. That must be fun to be able to be yourself and just relax on TV. Now, what is your typical day like on PM Magazine now in Hartford? I actually show up around 8 o'clock in the morning and I view stories which we have to talk about on the air for the coming week. And that takes about an hour. And then we usually have some meetings in which we go over our game plan for the week. After that, we usually go out and do a, a show or two. Now, what you see on the air every Monday through Friday at 7.30 on Channel 3 is actually 8 to 10 minutes of local production, mm -hmm. not including stories. You see four stories on a given night. Mm -hmm. One of those are probably from us, which we do in a month. It takes about a month to put together a story, but the actual on-air work is about eight minutes. So as a consequence, all it takes is to get in the van, go to a given location, read some lines, or just sort of ad-lib, do a stand-up, and we're out of there in no time. I mean, I'm feeling sorry for you over nothing. And, and people don't realize, that's exactly right, people don't realize that it really doesn't take too long to do a show. But where the work comes in is coming back to the station and lining up those stories and producing them and writing them and arranging them and traveling all over the place to, to videotape them and then put them together and air them. That's where the work comes in. Because we not only have a commitment locally, but we have a commitment for the national office and a national commitment. Many of our stories we produce here end up being seen all around the country, which is which is a neat way to work it. Yeah. Now, you mentioned before about England going over to Europe. Tell me, did that really help you at all in the creative aspect of what you're doing now? Because a lot of people bring up, a lot of celebrities say, I went to Europe for three years and just tried to soak in all the atmosphere. Did that help any? I think so. My college education was a liberal arts education. So I learned a lot about different things. And I think it's the best type of education to get, really, when you aren't particularly directed. But I also think that traveling opened my eyes to, to what I learned in college. You would study about philosophers, people who tried to change the world, and you'd study about different cities and how these cities evolved and what they turned into and uh, so forth. But I think traveling really opens up your eyes and, and then you realize how important these places are. I needed to see people for myself. I needed to go to, for example, Northern Ireland and take a look at the situation in Belfast firsthand mm. and learn about what was going on there, talk to the people about the struggle, what was happening in that country. I needed to go to London to see Buckingham Palace with my very own eyes. I wanted to tour Scotland. I wanted to go to Mexico and find out how can 12 million people live in Mexico City. It's unheard of, and how do they live? Yeah. So I did that for a while. So I really think that if a person has the ability to travel, which means that he has the money and the time, by all means, do it. By all means. And it's better, I think, to do it while you're young and before you get married and are tied down, because you'll probably never do it again unless yeah. you become rich and you can afford to, to take off a lot of time and do a lot of traveling. But I think it did open up my eyes, and it was a very, very good thing for me. In retrospect, it has helped me even in this job, because we have so many stories, and I can usually find many different things I know yeah. about a particular story and then add my own thoughts to it. And in that way, I think traveling has helped me a great deal. Now, speaking of traveling, do you do a lot with PM Magazine? I didn't when I was in Des Moines, Iowa, for that four years. We weren't, quote, unquote, a traveling PM. But here we are. And in just the last few months, we've been to Hawaii, which you saw this past week. And I was very week. jealous, and yeah. We've been to Washington, D.C., spent a week there and had a great set of shows. Mm -hmm. San Francisco and the Caribbean. Oh, the Caribbean was marvelous. Have you ever been down there? Never. Has never. anybody in here been down to the Caribbean? Have you at home? It's wonderful because <laughs> I have never seen such beautiful water in my life. It is crystal clear. You can see 50 to 100 feet down. Really? And you've got white coral reef, which makes it even more gorgeous. Yeah. The restaurants, the food, the people, the hotels. We stayed at a hotel called the Divi St. James down there on St. Martin, right on the beach. And I'd never had such 
wonderful accommodations. We were right on the beach. And so I'd open my doors up after working when I'd come back, and the people would give me fruit baskets and, and whatever I wanted to, soft drinks and so forth. And I'd sit out there with palm trees and the beach, the white sand, and just sort of relax, and it was just wonderful, really wonderful. And we'll be right back after this commercial break.